Okay, so we are looking at now the second letter of the seven letters that went out to the seven churches in the beginning of the book of Revelation. Obviously, this is the letter that's to the church in Smyrna. So as we're looking at what this letter says, we want to understand what Smyrna is. If you were here weeks ago, a couple times we put up a, a picture of these seven churches, and you might recall that the uh, order in which these letters are written works out to be a horseshoe. So it starts in Ephesus, then Smyrna, and as it goes on, it kind of goes northeast, and then it ca caps in the top, and then comes back down. It makes a horseshoe. So it's kind of a systematic um, sending of messages to these churches. And so Smyrna is a little bit inland from Ephesus. It's the next church uh, the next stop in the uh, angelic route of these messages being spread. Smyrna was a city that won the right in the time of John's writing to be a host for the emperor. In AD 29, there were seven cities who competed for the right to build a temple to the emperor Tiberius. Smyrna was chosen. They won the right to have this temple, and it a acquired another temple under the emperor Hadrian, and archaeologists today have discovered coins portraying Nero, dedications to emperors Titus and Domitian, and statues of Domitian, Trajan, and Hadrian. So all of this um, archaeological evidence that we have demonstrates that Smyrna was a place that really revered the emperor. Smyrna was a place where if you walked around on the streets, you were likely to bump into a lot of people who liked the emperor, who paid deference to the emperor. Uh, it wouldn't be like going to, I don't know, some conservative city in Texas, some backwoods place in Texas, and asking them what they think of Joe Biden, right? You're pretty much guaranteed to hear them say, we don't like Biden. It'd be like going to San Francisco or L.A. City and asking someone there what they think of Joe Biden, and the odds are they're going to say, we love him, we think he's a great guy. That was Smyrna, right? They liked the emperor. They competed to uh, honor the emperor. Now, this is significant for our understanding this letter because at this time, there was this movement in the honoring of the emperor that kind of ratcheted up a few degrees. So it started with, you just need to revere the emperor. But it started to get to the point where they were saying, not only do you need to honor the emperor, but you need to essentially worship the emperor. Hence, Smyrna competing for the right to have a temple for the emperor. The, this thing called emperor worship started to, to manifest. So... While emperor worship's going on, you've got about 60 million people in the Roman Empire. And of those 60 million people, the Jews comprised about 5 million. So that's over 10% of the population was Jewish. That's, that's not nothing. That's a significant portion of the population were these Jewish people. Now obviously, in the Roman Empire, especially in Smyrna, where you have this honor for the emperor that's starting to become worship of the emperor, if you're a Jewish person, if you're one of those people who makes up a large proportion of society, you're going to have a problem with what's going on, right? If as a Jewish person and you hear someone say, let's go to the new emperor's temple and honor him as a Jewish person, you're going to have a problem with that. Well, the ways that, that the Jews dealt with this was by leveraging their numbers. They basically <clears throat> went to the emperor and they said, well, we make up over 10% of the population. We're a large proportion here. You don't want to upset us. You don't want to revolt on your hands. Sure, you'll probably stop us if we revolt, but if 10% of your population starts fighting against you, you're going to have a lot of casualties, a lot of death, a lot of problems. So what did the Jews do to work out this situation? Well, what they did was they said, listen, we are going to honor the emperor. We're going to pay our taxes. We're going to do everything that all the other citizens do, except for going to the temple and making sacrifices to the emperor. That's the one thing we don't want to do. <clears throat> and the Roman Empire said, okay, deal. That's why the temple at the time of John's writing, or perhaps uh, a little bit before John's writing, the temple, which was destroyed in AD 70, it was the most magnificent temple that had existed yet. This is the second temple, the Jewish temple, and it was referred to as the Herodian temple 
because Herod built it up. He, he spent significant Roman money to build up this temple. It was a beautiful temple. And he did that because he struck a deal with the Jews. He said, okay, I will, I'll build up your temple. You worship your God here as long as you pay all your taxes and revere me. And you see that work out in the Gospels, right? What are the Pharisees constantly trying to get Jesus to do? They're constantly trying to get Jesus to say, don't pay taxes to Caesar, right? Isn't that one of the things they say? They say, hey, Jesus, should we pay taxes to Caesar or not? And what were they trying to do? They were trying to get Jesus to say, don't pay taxes to Caesar. Why were they trying to get Jesus to say that? Well, because then they could go to Caesar and say, look, here's someone who's against you. He doesn't want to pay taxes. You should go kill him. The Jews were allying, allying themselves with the Roman emperors. And Smyrna was a place where this was at a fever pitch. They really were allied with the emperors. Now, the Roman Empire, as I said, about 60 million people. Jewish people, about 5 million people. But at the time of the writing of this letter, Christians probably comprised of no more than about 50,000 people. So compared to 5 million and 60 million, 50,000 people is tiny. Christians comprised a very small minority of the Roman Empire. To the Roman eye, the Christians were really just this little sect within Judaism. They didn't care. Most Romans didn't even know what they were about. If you read some of the historical documents of Romans writing about Christians, they say, oh, they, the Christians followed some guy named Christus. They didn't even get Christ's name right. They didn't really know. They weren't paying attention. They thought it was this little sect which is a testament to the power of God, something that started so small has taken over the world, which is prophesied in the Bible. Christianity will take over the world. And at the second coming of Christ, that will be fulfilled. There will be nothing but Christians in the new heavens and new earth. Christianity will overtake the world. But at this time, it hadn't yet. It was a seed. It was small. So what do you do if you're a Christian? Right? You're, you're, one, you're one of these 50,000 people. You're in this really small group. You're living in Smyrna. They're, they just built this big temple to the emperor. And they're saying, hey, you need to go to the temple and make some sacrifices to him. And you're a little Christian. Well, what do you do? You're not going to go to the temple and make a sacrifice to the emperor. You don't want to stay home when they say go make a sacrifice to the emperor because then you're going to get persecuted and thrown in jail. So what do you do? Well, obviously, what you do is you say, hey, I'm one of those guys. I'm, I'm a Jew. I worship the God of the Jews. They have an exemption. I have an exemption. The Romans looked at the Christians as a sect within Judaism anyways. And so as a Christian, that's what you'd likely say. You say, hey, I'm, I'm of, I read the Old Testament. I worship Yahweh. I get the same exemption as them. I worship the God of the temple, Herod's temple. That's what you would do, logically speaking. And most commentators and studiers of history look at this text and think that's probably what was going on in this text in Smyrna and indeed the book of Revelation. We see this, hints of this in verse 9. Jesus says to the Smyrna Christians, I know your tribulation and your poverty, but you're rich, and the blasphemy by those who say they are Jews and are not, but are a synagogue of Satan. Hey, what's that talking about? Well, if the Christians were saying, hey, I'm part of the Jewish people. I get this Jewish exemption. I don't need to make sacrifices at the emperor's temple. Don't persecute me. If the Christians are doing that, what are the Jews going to say? Exactly the same thing that they said to Christ, about Christ, right? They would say, oh, no, he's not a true Jew. He's a worshiper of Satan. He works for Beelzebul. He's not one of us. What was that? Blasphemy. The Jews blasphemed Christ. They said Christ is not a true Jew. They separated themselves from Christ. So the Jews would do the same thing to the Christians. They would say, oh, these Christians aren't part of us. They're worshipers of Satan. They're not part of our group. And so Christ, looking at these Christians, he says, well, they are blaspheming you. I know the blasphemy by those who say they're Jews and are not. The blasphemy. What's the blasphemy? Well, blasphemy is is not a theological word yet when John's writing. Blasphemy just means slander. It's a word that the pagan Greeks knew. You didn't have to be a Christian or a Jew to know the word blasphemia. It just meant slander. And so 
blasphemy here in this case is almost certainly not blasphemy against God primarily or, or firstly, but it's firstly blasphemy against Christians. It's saying, no, these Christians worship Satan. They don't really worship God. And so Christ says, I know this blasphemy. And who is it coming from? Well, those who say they are Jews. But notice he says, they say they're Jews, but they are not. Now this is a very recurring theme in the New Testament. Jesus goes to the Pharisees, and the Pharisees are the Jews of all Jews, the cream of the crop of the Jewish community. And Jesus says, no, 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 you're not Jews. You're not sons of Abraham. Who does he say they're sons of? Satan, right? Exactly. He says, you're not really Jews. Even though you have the biological pedigree, you might be able to go on Ancestry.com and say that Abraham was your father biologically, but actually you're not even a Jew. Actually, you're sons of Satan. Paul the Apostle, he says this in the book of Romans. You can see that in Romans 2, 28 and 29, and Romans 4, 11 to 16. He says, true Jews are not biologically related. True Jews are those who believe in Christ. That's what it means to be a Jew, which is why as Reformed people read the New Testament, kind of as an aside here, we don't look to Israel and say, like, you know, we have to support the, the biologically ethnic Jewish people, right? We, we don't spend a lot of time um, and trying to support people who can biologically trace their lineage to Abraham because as New Testament Christians, we say the biological reality is not what's important. It doesn't matter if you're born in the Holy Land. What matters is if you have faith in Christ. And if you are a biological Jew today who lives in Jerusalem, but you have no faith in Christ, you are his enemy. That's the New Testament reality. A, a Dutch person uh, who has absolutely no biological relation to Abraham or any Jewish people who believes in Christ is more of a Jew than an Orthodox Jewish person who lives in Jerusalem. And so Christ, he's looking at these Christians who are being ousted by the Jewish people. And he says, they're blaspheming you and they're not even really Jews. And then he ramps it up like Christ does in the Gospels. And he says, they say they're Jews or not, but are a synagogue of Satan. He says they are actually worshiping Satan. He flips the accusation that the Jews leveled at Christ on its head. And he says, though they claimed Christ and his followers worship Satan, the opposite is the reality. Now, we live in a time today where the exact same thing's happening. We live in a time today where people look at Christians and people tell Christians that they are bigots. People tell Christians that they are unloving unforgiving, judgmental, backwards, uh, ignoring science, ignoring the facts, and they don't care about the truth. That is what society says about Christians. But, biblically speaking, according to God, the exact opposite is the truth. The people who say that, let's say a evolutionary atheist, the person who's saying that to a Christian is ignoring the science. Science clearly points to the fact that someone created everything. A person who uh, is in that situation who says uh, we should just let people do whatever they want. We should place no restrictions on sexual ethics or the things that children want to do with their bodies. Well, that person is being unloving. You could go down the list and all the accusations that the world is making against Christians, those are all actually accusations that Christ would make to the world. Right? It's like I remember my... English teacher in junior high told me, every time you point your finger at somebody, there's three fingers pointing back at you. That's the situation with the world. They're pointing their fingers at Christianity, but all the things that they're saying about Christianity are actually true of themselves. This is what Christ is saying. They're blaspheming you, Christians. They're saying they're Jews, they're not, but the reality is that they are a synagogue of Satan. The things that they're saying against you are actually being applied to them. The Jews are saying the Christians are blasphemers, but it's really the Jews who are being, or the false Jews who are being blasphemous. So, in this letter, as he continues on, he says in verse 10, do not fear what you are about to suffer. So he says, there's this 
separation between the, the ethnic Jews or the Pharisees and the Christians. And as the Christians are being kind of left out in the cold, well, what's going to happen? They can't go hide with the Jews. The Romans aren't going to take them in because they're not worshiping the emperor. So you're left in no man's land. If you're one of those 50,000 Christians, you're open to attack. So now the Romans are coming. And they're saying, worship the emperor or get killed. You can't hide behind the Jewish exemption. And so naturally, Jesus speaking to this church in verse 10, he says, do not fear what you are about to suffer. Now, right off the bat, we notice how antithetical this is to so much Christianity that you and I both experience, right? You turn on the TV and you hear a Christian preacher you go on the computer and you hear, see some Christian content. Uh, you hear, turn on the radio and listen to someone talking about Christ. Not all the time, but a lot of the time, what you hear is Jesus loves you and he has a wonderful plan for your life. All you need to do is accept him into your heart. Jesus wants you to have a wonderful life. He has a plan for your prosperity. If you believe in him, he will heal your diseases he will fix your finances. He'll give you a spouse and he'll make you live longer. That's what Christianity in America teaches. Not all the time, but a lot of the time. But when we look at what's going on here in this text, what do, what do we hear Jesus saying? Does he say, I have a wonderful plan for you. If you believe in me, you're going to have a mansion down in Malibu and there's going to be four cars in the garage. Is that what Jesus says? No, Jesus says, do not fear what you are about to suffer. You are going to suffer. I am not going to stop you from suffering. But the command from Jesus is not run from the suffering. There is no consolation saying, I'm going to prevent you from suffering. But Christ says, do not fear fear what you're about to suffer. This is true Christianity. So Christ continues and he says, well, behold, the devil is about to cast some of you into prison so that you will be tested and you will have tribulation for 10 days. This is why the Christians are going to suffer. He explains to them, this is the suffering. Satan is coming and he's going to cast some of you into prison. <clears throat> now, when John was writing this at this time, prison for a Roman person was not quite like we have prison today. Right? People can get locked up and just put in prison for the rest of their lives. Prison, we use prison today as a form of punishment. But in John's time, prison was usually, if not always, used as a temporary holding place until the sentencing would occur. That was really what prison was used for. They put someone who was accused of some crime in prison until they figured out this is the punishment, and then they took them out of prison, and they punished them, either by uh, forcing them into slavery or beating them or executing them. That was the pattern. And so we see a, a little glimpse of this because he says you're going to be thrown into prison, and then he says at the end of the verse, verse 10, be faithful unto death, until death, right? So we see here, he's, he, it's not just that you're going to get thrown in prison and stay there, but it's likely that you're going to get thrown in prison. They're going to figure out what to do with you, and the conclusion will be, let's get them out of prison so we can kill them because they're not worshiping the emperor. So Christ says, the devil's casting you into prison so that you will be tested so that you will be tested. Now this testing is a really interesting word in the New Testament. The word to test is perizo. And perizo can mean test, perizo can mean tempt, or something in between. It can be a positive term. It can be something like God is testing Abraham, as we'll see here in a minute. Or it could mean something negative, like Satan is tempting someone. It can be used both ways in this text, right? Primarily, it's talking about the devil tempting them. You could translate it, you will be tempted, right? Well, what's the temptation? Say, oh, I worship the emperor. I don't worship Jesus. Let me out of prison. That would be the temptation. That's the test. So this word testing can mean different things. You see in Hebrews chapter 11, 
verse 17, you see the same word, perizo. It says, by faith, Abraham, when he was tested, perizo, offered up Isaac. So who's doing the testing in that verse in Hebrews eleven seventeen? God, right? God is the one who was testing Abraham. God peridzoed Abraham. You see the same use in John chapter 6, verse 6. God doing the testing, peridzo. But then you see in 1 Thessalonians chapter 3, verse 5, Satan does the peridzo. For this reason, when I could endure it no longer, I also sent to know about your faith, lest somehow the tempter, peridzo, has tempted, peridzo, you and our labor be in vain. So same word in the New Testament, used sometimes of God, used sometimes of Satan. Now it's important for us to understand as we're looking at this verse, because the testing that is happening here to the Smyrna Christians is on the one hand inflicted by Satan, Satan working through the Roman leaders, but on the other hand, it is part of God's sovereignty, which is testing and refining God's people in order to produce for them the crown of life that Jesus speaks about in the 11th verse. You see a similar use of the word in 1 Corinthians 10, 13. No temptation has overtaken you, but such as is common to man. But God is faithful, who will not allow you to be tempted, peridzo, beyond what you are able, but with a temptation that will provide the way of escape also, so that you will be able to endure it. Paul again says the same thing in 2 Corinthians 12, 7, talking about the thorn in his flesh, that famous passage. He says, I was given this thorn in the flesh. Why? To perizo me, to test me, and to humble me. So what's the point of this? What, is, what can we draw from this from our lives, especially here in verse 10, this testing? Well, the first thing that we can draw from verse 10 is the recognition that if we are Christians, we will be tested. We will be peridzoed. There will, there will come testing. And it's important for us to recognize that in the midst of our testing, often that testing comes to us like Paul's thorn in the f- flesh, like Job being tested by Satan. That thorn, that testing comes to us ultimately from God, but approximately from Satan. We can go through seasons in our lives where we feel like Satan is attacking us, but ultimately, as is the case with Smyrna and the devil throwing Christians into prison, ultimately this testing comes from God. Many times the Christian goes through his life where he goes through an experience where he feels like God is out to get him. He feels like God is after him. That's what Job said. God, why are you slaying me? Why are you attacking me? Why are you making me your enemy? The Christian goes through experiences where he feels like God is after him. But the reality is that it's Satan. Now, that doesn't mean that God is not able to restrain Satan. It doesn't mean that God and Satan are equal forces. And it's like the angel Gabriel in the book of Daniel saying, oh, I was doing battle over here and I got bound up for a while and that's why I'm late to the meeting. God's never late. God doesn't do battle. God is the victor. It doesn't mean that God and Satan are equal, but it means that God allows Satan to test us, to tempt us, to peridzo us in order to test us, to refine us, to build us up. And the result you see is in the end of verse 10. Be faithful until death, and I will give you the crown of life. Satan's testing of the Smyrna Christians and Satan's testing of us in our lives is the mechanism by which God grants to us the crown of life. Such that when we go to heaven, we will look back at a difficult life where Satan was buffeting us on all sides, and we'll look to Christ and we'll say thank you. Thank you, Christ, for allowing Satan to attack me because this produced the crown of life that I wear. And so the second implication of that is related to the first, and it is that the Christian can never 
should never be in a situation in his life, no matter how dark that situation is, and lose hope. If you are surrounded by nothing but darkness, there isn't a Christian around you for a hundred miles, and everybody around you is worshiping Satan himself, you don't hear any praising going on, you don't hear the proclamation of the gospel going on, you don't even have a Bible, you are surrounded by utter and complete darkness. If you were to be in that situation, you could still rejoice and have hope, because all of that means that God is using Satan to test you. And when God tests his true children, they always overcome. They always receive the crown of life. The Christian should never be the person who says, the world's going to hell in a handbasket. We just need to run away and hunker down and wait for it to be over. If Satan's taking over. We should just give up. The, the Christian should never say things like that. Because even the darkness is a tool by God for goodness. And so Jesus says this testing, he says it's also a tribulation, which is a word for distress. It's a hard time. He says in verse 10, this testing, this tribulation will last for 10 days. We've already seen that John here in writing Revelation is relying a lot on Daniel, the book of Daniel. What happened to Daniel in the very beginning of the book? He was tested. Right? He was tested by Nebuchadnezzar. He was tested by what? By the eating of the king's food. Unclean food. What did Daniel say? I'm not going to eat the food. What did Daniel say? That he w How long did he say he wasn't going to eat the food? For 10 days. He said, give me water and vegetables for 10 days. So it's possible that John here is alluding to that. It might not be a literal 10 days. It might be saying that uh, God is going to test you for the, uh, a set amount of time. Kistemacher in his Reformed commentary says, in Revelation, the number 10 conveys the meaning of fullness in the decimal system. It is a symbolical number to express the completeness of the period of suffering, which is neither long nor sh short, but full, for its termination is sure. So the point here is that God has set down in his book the amount of time that we will be tested. Just like with Job, God goes to Satan and he says, you may test this my Christian, this my child, but here's the limits. For Job it was, you can do whatever you want, but don't take his life. Satan couldn't kill Job if he had all the world and all the angelic host and every demon at his disposal. He could not take Job's life because God said you can't take it. And it's the same here in this text. It's set. It's 10 days. The time period has been set by God. So we will, as Christians, endure certain trials and testings. But as we're going through those testings, we need to remember God's got the time set here. This is going to end when he wants it to end. I don't need to worry about when it's going to end because he's set the time. And so this crown of life that Christ promises is something that the Smyrnans would have been familiar with. <clears throat> In Smyrna, they didn't only revere the emperor, but they had Olympic games and things like that. And the winner of these games would be given a crown, right? You've probably seen pictures of what's called a laurel wreath, right? It's this thing made out of uh, leaves that the Romans would put on their heads, right? The statues of the Roman emperors, they have this wreath around their heads. That was the crown. They would give it to uh, the victor of an Olympic game. They would give it to the victor in a military conquest. The Christians in Smyrna would have seen these crowns all over the place. They were often referred to as the crown of life. And Christ is saying, you're going to get the real crown of life if you endure this persecution. Eusebius, the fourth century church father, he wrote about Christians dying and receiving this crown of life. This is after the New Testament, and it's a fulfillment of what Christ said in Romans 2. Eusebius, in the 300s later on, he said, Maturis, Sanctus, Blandina, and Attalus, that's four martyrs, were taken into the amphitheater to face the wild beasts and to furnish open proof of the inhumanity of the heathen, the day of fighting wild beasts being purposely arranged for our people, the Christians, 
there before the eyes of all, Maturus and Sanctus were again taken through the whole series of punishments and were now battling for the victor's crown. This is a fulfillment of what Christ is saying in Revelation 2. There's devil's going to throw you into prison and then you might get out of prison and be taken before the beasts, be faithful unto death, and if you are faithful unto death, you will receive the crown of life. In verse 11, he says, He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. This is something that Jesus regularly said. He said, He who has an ear, let him hear. You see that over and over again in the Gospels. He who has an ear, let him hear. Hear, He who has an ear, let him hear. And he says that here in John's revelation in order to signal to the reader, this is the authentic voice of Christ. Christ sees the suffering. This is him that is speaking to us. And he says, he who overcomes will never be hurt by the second death. He doesn't say the first death. The overcomer must overcome the pain, the hurt of the first death. But if he can overcome the pain and the hurt of the first death, Christ says he will not be hurt by the second death. That's the message of Christ. And again, we see how antithetical this is to so much modern preaching, prosperity preaching, that says if you believe in Christ, your life will be easy. Well, Christ does not promise that we will not be hurt by death. We will be hurt by death. We will all die, and some of us will die painfully. The promise of Christ is not that we will uh, lay on our hospital beds in a nice, easy, blissful, opiate-induced sleep and just drift off into the clouds. Some of us will be persecuted and perhaps even killed for our faith. We see that increasingly the case in America. People are more and more antithetically opposed to Christianity. Christ doesn't promise that won't happen. What he promises is, if we endure that, we will inherit the crown of life. Well, as we understand that message, that prompts a question, right? Especially for Reformed people. Especially for people who believe in perseverance of the saints. How is it the case that Christ says, if you endure, then I will give you the crown of life when the rest of the New Testament says, if you simply believe in Christ by faith alone, you will receive the crown of life. It might sound like Jesus is saying, you need to do something, you need to do a work, namely persevere, in order to receive salvation. Well, we know that the Bible, especially the New Testament, but the whole Bible does not teach works theology. The Bible from the very first page teaches that it's the grace of God that initiates our salvation because man is born in sin. It didn't take more than the first man and first woman for sin to happen. The Bible repeatedly tells us that the first man and woman were sinful and that their children were sinful and their children's children were sinful and that it, the sin was so pervasive that the psalmist says we are born in iniquity and in iniquity did our mothers conceive us. We know that we are born in sin, which therefore necessitates God's grace, which is what the theologians call monergistic. It's not synergistic. We don't work with that grace. It just comes to us by his sovereign grace. We know the Bible teaches that. Yet in this text, it looks like it says something different. So how do we marry those two things together? Well, the way that we make sense of this is not to throw out God's sovereign grace. It's not to throw out perseverance of the saints that says, since God saves us, he's not going to unsave us. Since he didn't wait for me to accept Jesus in my heart to save me, he's not going to change his mind later because the Bible says God is not a man that he should change his mind. So we don't throw out all that good doctrine, but what we do is we look at this and we say this is the evidence of salvation. The fact of the matter is that if somebody is saved by that sovereign grace of God, if God does grab a hold of the heart of a human being and change it from a heart of stone into a heart of flesh, if someone experiences that reality, it is unavoidable that that person will be faithful to the God who has done that even unto death. 
And so this is what the meaning of testing is. How do you know if you're a Christian? Well, for the ancient church, the early church, it was a really easy question to ask because there was persecution going on all over the place. And so when they said, how do you really know if you're a Christian? They just said, we'll see what happens when the Romans come, come marching through. Does the person abandon faith in Christ? They nope, I, I never met the guy. Like Peter, I don't believe him. Just abandon him three times before the rooster crows. Does the person do that? Or does the person, like Eusebius does, mentioning Marturus and Sanctus and Blandina and Attalus, do, do all, do, like those people, do they say, I know Christ and you can kill me because I belong to him? That's the testing of the faith. That's the proving that the faith is true. And so we see, in a really hard way, that persecution is actually a gift from God because it confirms our faith. I think most Christians ask themselves at some point in their life, if their lives have been really easy, do I really believe this stuff? It's, if it's never cost me anything to believe in Jesus, it's rational for us to ask, do I really believe this? Will I really profess faith in Christ when this starts costing me something? Well, persecution in that sense is a gift because we know the answer to the question. When we stand toe-to-toe with the government saying, reject Christ or die, and we say, I'd rather die, then we don't, there's no question in your mind whatsoever. You know. And there's no more blessed gift than the assurance that you will receive the crown of life. So this text teaches that we need to persevere because there are many people who appear to have salvation, but they really don't. That's what Christ means by this. He says, if you persevere, if you don't give up my name, I'll give you the crown of life, meaning you'll prove that you already had the crown of life. In chapter 3, verse 11, he says to the church in Philadelphia, he says, you already have the crown of life. Don't lose it. The point is, not that you receive it as a reward for persevering, but it is, the point is, if you persevere, the evidence is that you already have the crown of life. Well, as we consider what Christ says to Smyrna, and we consider the situation that we're in today, obviously, we're not there. Maybe we'll never be there. Maybe we're on the way to this type of persecution, but we're not in a position where the government is going through shutting down churches saying you need to worship the president or the governor or we're going to kill you. We're not there yet. But we are in a position that in one way, not in, not in most ways, but in one way is actually worse. There's one way in which the situation we're in is worse than the situation in which the Christians were in. And the one way that w- the situation we are in is, that is worse is that Satan's attempt to get us to give up faith in Christ is not by throwing us in jail and threatening us with execution, but rather it's by killing us with a death by a thousand cuts. That's Satan's tactic in America. It's not to throw you in jail and kill you. What is it? Well, just soften the edges on your doctrine a little bit. Don't believe the whole Bible. Just believe most of the Bible. Believe the red letters in your Bible, but not the rest of it. Certainly throw out Leviticus and all those harsh statements that God has made. Don't only soften your doctrine, but also soften the edges on your piety. Don't attend church twice on Sunday, do it once. Don't do it every Sunday, do it once a month. Don't do it once a month, do it on Christmas and Easter. Don't even do it on Christmas and Easter, just have a personal relationship with Jesus. Don't avoid that sin you're doing every single day. Just do it once a week. Don't be so harsh with yourself. Allow yourself a little bit of sin here and there. These are little cuts that Satan inflicts on the church of Christ. And we see right before our eyes the church of Christ enduring these little cuts and slowly and slowly giving in more and more and more and more until many in the church reach the point where they get the thousandth cut and they haven't gone to church in years. They've, the, their Bible has a quarter inch of dust 
on it, and they've been embracing the sins in their life that the Holy Spirit has been convicting them so much that they can't even hear God convicting them, and instead they go marching down the street proud of the sins that they've been committing against God, the whole time thinking and claiming to be Christians, and they find themselves twice the sons of hell that the synagogue of Satan was in Smyrna because they think that they're true Christians. And that is the worst place to be. In his book, The Screwtape Letters, C.S. Lewis impersonated a demon. And that demon that C.S. Lewis was writing about, the demon said, our hope is, is to get somebody not to worship Satan. How do we drag a person to hell? Not by making him a Satan worshiper, not by making him a drunk, not by making him a drug addict, right? Those people can repent. How do we drag people to hell? put him in the front row in the first pew every Sunday and make him think that he's a Christian while he's really not. And that's Satan's tactic in America, to slowly chip away at true Christianity and replace it with a false Christianity. He who has ears to hear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. And so Christ says, be faithful unto death. That is his charge to us. In a land where the church is increasingly becoming more and more unfaithful, Christ's command to us is to be faithful. This is the same word, faithful, pistos, that Christ uses in Matthew twenty-five, twenty-one. Well done, my good and faithful servant. Of course, pistos, faithful, means trusting, but it also means trustworthy. What's a good and faithful servant? Well, it's someone who trusts the master, but it's also someone who does what the master tells him to do. He's faithful. He's trustworthy. And so we see in the letter to Smyrna, we ultimately have the same implication as in the letter to the Ephesians. Right? The letter to the Ephesians said, hey, you've got great doctrine, but you've forgotten love. And if you really have true faith, you will have good doctrine, but you'll also have love. And it's the same thing to the church in Smyrna. If you have true faith, it will produce faithfulness. You won't allow Satan to chip away at your faith. You won't give up parts of your doctrine. You won't give up parts of your Bible. You won't give in to certain sins increasingly more and more. Christ speaks the final word here. Not from Revelation 2, but from Matthew 14. He was talking to Peter on the water. And Peter, with great boldness, with great faith, with great pistos, walks out onto the water. But then he sees the waves. Seeing the wind, he became frightened. And beginning to sink, he cried out, saying, Lord, save me. And immediately Jesus stretched out his hand and took hold of him and said to him, You of little faith, little pistos, why did you doubt? You see, the reality is, when Christ tells us to be faithful, at some points in our lives, we'll have little faith. We'll be like Peter. We'll look at the waves. We'll see the marching Roman army. And we'll be tempted to have little faith. Our hope is not in mustering up faith, but it's in grabbing onto the hand of Christ, who is the truly faithful one. Paul says in Philippians 1.6, I am confident of this very thing, that he who began a good work in you will perfect it until the day of Christ Jesus. If you have a little bit of faith, just a little bit, that's evidence of the Holy Spirit working in you. And the Bible says, well, if God put a little seed of faith in you, he, that means it's going to grow into an oak tree. And the way that that oak tree grows is the same way that trees in the world grow. Where are the strongest root systems in the world? Trees that are in really windy climates. Because as the wind pushes on the tree and parizos the tree and temp- tempts and tests the tree, what does the tree do? The roots grow deeper and deeper and it gets healthier and healthier. And so you might find yourself in a position where you're tested. It might feel like Satan is attacking you. But what's happening? It's not that God's hands are tied. It's not that hate Satan is doing something to you that God had not planned. But actually, God is sovereignly not only testing your faith, but growing it. He who be- 
began a good work in you will bring it to completion. In this way, we can do what Paul says, rejoice always. Even in the midst of Satan assaulting us, we can rejoice and we say, thank you, God, because you are growing my faith. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for your word. We thank you for your grace. And we thank you for this letter to the Smyrna Christians. Lord, we confess to you that we are weak and our faith is often small like Peter's. But Lord, we worship a great and mighty God and we believe that the work that you began into us is being worked into something greater from one degree of glory to the next. And you will bring this work unto completion and the end result will be us inheriting the victor's crown, the crown of life. I pray that you would set before our minds this evening that final goal, the crown of life, hearing the words of our Savior, well done, my good and faithful servant. Would you put steel in our spines, Lord, to pursue that final victory above all things, above the adulation and applause of man, above the comforts of society, above the, uh, the, the goals that we might set for ourselves. Lord, allow us to pursue above all things the crown of life, which comes to those who are faithful, who are those that know Christ. We pray this in his name. Amen. If you're able, let's stand and sing, find us.